Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at game nine in the uh, Ian Napomniche versus Magnus Carlsen World Championship match. And if you like this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So Napomniche is down two points at this point in the match, and he decides to switch up his openings. Instead of going for his normal e4, he switches to pawn to c4. And he um, actually... Uh, plays something that um, Carlson was kind of essaying. He kind of plays a um, kind of a neo catalan type position. Uh, after e6, he plays g3, d5, and then bishop to g2. Um, he's playing a type of uh, a neo catalan where it's not, it's not quite the Catalan, but it's not quite not. He's got some pressure on the long diagonal, and um, he ended up with a very interesting position. Uh, Magnus uh, pushed the pawn to d4, and now we have sort of uh, what we could call maybe a reverse Benoni, uh, where these extra tempo for white should actually matter, and um, white should get some sort of advantage here. So Napomniche continues with knight f3. We have uh, uh, Carlson playing knight to c6. We have castles kingside and bishop c5, and then we have d3, knight f6, knight on b to d2. All these moves are kind of standard. Um, but these extra tempos that white has in this position, in this type of uh, Benoni structure, they really do matter because um, it's basically white's plan to eventually uh, push his queenside pawn majority, eventually play e3, get moves in like e3 takes, and then bishop e3, and um, go after the queenside and try to break apart the center. And um, every single tempo that you can get in these positions uh, makes a huge, huge difference. So uh, Carlson plays the typical move. He plays a5, which is aimed at slowing down uh, white's expansion with um, a3 and b4. Uh, but this allows Napomniche to gain a, a, a valuable tempo with knight to b3, um, which lets him strike in the middle with pawn to e3. And then after d e3, bishop e3, it's very clear um, that white has some sort of advantage here in the middle of the board. All of his pieces are, are very active. His pawn on d3 is only temporarily backwards. He can fix this seemingly at any point with the move pawn to d4. And white uh, kind of enjoys a comfortable advantage. So I want to say that um, if uh, if this was some uh, kind of preparation from Napomniche's team, I think that throughout this match, I think Napomniche's team uh, did a spectacular job. Um, I think at some point in one of the interviews, um, they asked Napomniche if he would um, change his team if he could pick from any players in history, and he said he was very happy with his team. And uh, based on the preparation I've seen so far in this match, I can I can tell why. I mean, the, this is some very top-notch opening preparation. White clearly has some sort of advantage here. White's doing very good. So after knight to g4, uh, which Magnus played to contest this bishop and um, try to put some pressure on white to at least exchange a few pieces to equalize, Napomniche plays the logical bishop c5, uh, and then we have castles, and then we have pawn to d4, and Napomniche just has a um, small advantage in the middle of the board with the two central pawns. We have a4, we have this exchange, and then the knight comes to the very aggressive uh, c5 square, and I mean, what can we say? Uh, white is clearly better. So now at this point, um, Magnus plays the move pawn to a3, and I think Napomniche plays kind of a hasty move here. Uh, he immediately uh, takes the pawn. He probably could have played for a much larger advantage if he'd played the move pawn to b4. And um, this is kind of a critical idea. The basic concept is to maintain this knight, but also the idea is if the knight takes on b4, uh, black is just going to have a whole bunch of weaknesses. For example, rook to b1, and we can re-harvest this pawn on b7 at any point. So like after, say, knight to uh, c6, we're going to be playing knight takes b7. Um, it's also important to note um, that we're not going to be able to uh, play a move like knight to a2, uh, because this knight uh, doesn't have a way back, so we would just simply attack this knight with our queen. Like, queen c2 would be fairly simple, and we're winning a whole knight, so we can't do that. So, b4 was the way to go to play for an advantage, but Napomniche fairly quickly um, just played the move b takes a3, which gives up a, a little bit of his advantage, but it sh this, this position should still be advantage white. Um, you know, white's still just a, a very little bit better here. So we have uh, rook d8, we have knight back to b3, and then we have uh, knight back to f6. Um, you know, Carlson, he, he was going to need to retreat this knight at some point. It could have gotten kicked at any point. When this knight moved, the knight was going to be hanging to queen g4. There were too many discoveries against it. So he's just basically solidifying his position and saying, okay, what are you going to do? 
because he knows he's worse here. And Magnus Carlsen is just very calm. He's just going to play solid moves, make sure that his position isn't going to fall apart, and just just basically play solid chess. So this is Napomniche's game to win. At this point, I would say that the traditional logic is Napomniche is playing for two results. You know, it seems like either he's going to draw or he's going to win. So we have rook e1, queen a3, uh, queen e2, again, just, just centralizing material, um, gaining space with h4, all these moves are fine. Bishop d7, Carlson is just trying to connect the rooks, put his bishop on a solid square. After knight e5, we have bishop e8. This is a move, a good defensive maneuver that's favored by stronger players, and usually weaker players don't do it because they don't feel like putting their pieces on the back rank. But it's really critical because the bishop controls just as much of a diagonal from e8 as it did from d7. But the difference is, is it protects the f7 square and it leaves the rook on an open file. So bishop 8 is like a really good stabilizing move to just completely equalize for black and just say, okay, now all my pieces are on good squares. What are you going to do to improve your position? And that's a question that Napomniche has to answer. So he plays queen e3, which is good. It's just a small patient improvement. We have queen b4. We have rook on e to b1, putting our rook on that open file, threatening the queen. Uh... Magnus exchanges on e5, and then even Magnus admitted that after knight g4, he actually missed the move, queen e1. Um, this knight is in a tough spot. It doesn't have a clear way back. If you remember previously, he had actually retreated that knight to f6 to give it a clear way back. After queen e1, he's forced to exchange queens because there is this huge threat of trapping this knight on the g4 square if he just retreats his queen. So he's obligated to exchange queens. And then he's obligated to find a safe place for this knight to go back to. So Magnus immediately plays the move pawn to h5 to at least give this knight some retreat on the h6 square. But that unfortunately drops the pawn on b7. And now Napomniche just has a clear um, edge in the position. He's up a pawn. He has a very dangerous uh, past a pawn that he can push down the board. And he has a slight edge. And this is a, a wonderful position where Napomniche should start pressing. Um, it was a huge success for, obviously, Napomniche's team to get to a position like this out of the opening and finally outplay uh, Magnus Carlsen for the first 26 moves and reach a position where they not only had an advantage, but they're up an entire pawn. So Carlsen just plays an active move. He plays rook a4, um, just saying, hey, okay, I know I'm worse here, but I'm just going to put my pieces on some active squares, and I'm going to be okay. So, I mean, at this point, um, you know, all Napomniche has to do is just um, make some sort of either, you know, forward-moving aggressive move like knight to c5, or, you know, some safeguarding move like maybe bringing the bishop back, or maybe gaining a tempo with, like, pawn f3, making this knight retreat, and then, you know, bringing this bishop back. I mean, he has a lot of options here to start playing for a win. Um, but instead, uh, relatively quickly, um, um, Napomniche plays the move pawn to c5, which immediately loses. Uh, he's up on pawn, and this bishop is trapped, I mean, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I want to say that this was some kind of miscalculation. What's a shame about this is he had a great position. You know, he's down two points in the match, and he has every opportunity to play for a win here. All he has to do is be patient. You know, you're not playing against, you know, some random guy off the street. You're playing against the world champion in this position. Um, I know that he wants to win. You know, I know that his mind is focused on winning, so you're looking at moves like c5, you're looking at ways to make progress, and you're looking at ways to make progress as quickly as possible. But I think this is the same thing that happened to him in his other two, in, in, in his other um, loss, not, not the game six. I think in game six, I think he was very objective, and he just lost a very tough, very long game. The very next game he lost, game eight, I feel like he lost his objectivity because he was trying way too hard to play for a win. And I think the same thing happened here. Um, and he was trying way too hard to play for a win in game eight, where he was actually slightly worse. In this game, he's got an advantage. He's slightly better. It, he has to play calmly, and he has to play carefully, though, to convert an advantage like this against the world champion, against one of the best players that's ever lived. You can't just play like you're playing against a club player and just play a move like c5 and hope that nothing bad happens. You have to calculate. You have to be very, very careful. This is a dangerous opponent. So I think he lost his objectivity because he just wanted to win so bad. He was down two points, and he wanted to win so bad. He saw the opportunity to play c5, hoping that he would immediately play c5 and c6. 
But this is the only threat on the board. The only threat on the board is to play pawn to c6. So there's only one move that you even need to calculate, and that's the move pawn to c6. So I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say maybe he miscalculated pawn to c6, not realizing that his bishop was trapped, which is very similar to what happened to Fisher. Of course, uh, you know, there are a lot of comparisons made after this to the, uh, you know, Fisher-Spassky match in 1972 when Fisher did something very similar. He trapped his own bishop on the, um, you know, on the h2 square uh, against Boris Spassky, and that turned out to just be a miscalculation. He he grabbed the pawn on h2 thinking that he could play you know, he could play h5 and h4 very, very quickly and save that bishop. And as it turned out, there was a nuanced little king move that he missed. And I'll try to give um, Nepomniche the benefit of the doubt and say that there was a move that he missed here as well. Because I think what happened was, is what happened in the game after c6, I think he intended what he played, which was f3, and then Magnus retreats with knight h6, and then we have rook e4. And then, okay, we're jumping on this bishop right away. And it's really important that black jumps on this bishop right away to grab it, because the longer that bishop stays there, the longer white can combine attacking ideas and maybe just use that bishop on that trapped square to do something nasty. So we have rook a7 just immediately threatening to capture this bishop. And then we have rook b4. And I think this is actually, we're coming up on what Nepomniche missed, which is after rook b8, I think what he missed was is that he thought he had something like bishop c6 here, which would give him a very dangerous pass to c-point. So the idea would be to to only be down an exchange. So I think what he missed was that after bishop to c6, we have rook b4, and then he would play something like bishop e8, and this pawn is just super, super dangerous, and it's just going to fly up the board and just create massive, massive threats and um, being down the exchange isn't a big deal because, of course, this knight is out of play and we have, you know, very strong pieces and very dangerous pawns. And I think he was maybe just unobjectively thinking that this was leading to a win. But, of course, after bishop e8, there's just rook takes b3 because this is a pin. And black is completely winning. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say maybe this is what he missed. Maybe he missed rook b3 at the end of everything. Um, but in any case, at this point, the game is effectively over. He has nothing. So he tried uh, a4, and then we have rook b7, uh, you know, netting a whole piece, and now Magnus Carlsen is up a whole piece. Uh, rook b6, this is a good good effort. Um, it, it creates some, some dangerous threats with the uh, past a pawn um, after the capture. And of course, it obligates black to capture, because if he doesn't, uh, Nahomache is going to play a5. So this is a good attempt at complicating. Um, he plays the knight to c5, and now there is this threat of this past a pawn uh, that has to be contended with. And that has to be uh, dealt with very accurately. So we have knight f5, we have a5, uh, rook back to b8. This is correct. Um, there, there are still ways that, that black can go wrong here, so this isn't terrible. And then we have a6, and then we have a awesome calculation from uh, Magnus Carlsen. A lot of players would be um, kind of lazy here and just play something like knight d4 and just eventually win, um, just because knight d4 kind of guarantees that you're going to get back in time uh, to stop this pawn, and you don't have to worry about losing um, to some crazy um, pawn pushes. Um, one of the scary things about this position is before we play pawn to a7, we can, of course, lead up to it with the move knight a4 first, and then play a7 with the idea of if rook a8, we're going to be playing knight b6, and we're going to be winning. Um, so it's, it's kind of terrifying to look at, but Magnus Carlsen calculated correctly and realized that he could simply play the move knight captures g3, and if you can take a pawn like this and make your position much easier to win at the end of all of the calculations, then you should take a pawn like this um, and just make the position resignable. And that's exactly what Carlson did. He's getting away with this because he has this extra tempo to get back into the game because he is coming to e2 with check. And that one tempo actually makes all the difference. Um, Nepomniche gives it the, his best shot. He plays knight to a4. And then Magnus Carlson follows through with his very careful calculation. He has to play c5 here with the idea of bringing this bishop to c6 to defend, but then he also has to be very careful about exactly what order he does all of that in. After the move pawn to a7, for example, um, the move rook to a8 would, of course, be completely losing um, after knight to b6, but he plays very correctly. He plays rook to d8, and then um, the pawn de throws one last um, way for Carlsen to go wrong. He plays the move knight to c5, and now Magnus just puts a stop to everything with a super accurate move. He just plays the move rook a8, which caused Nepomniche to resign. Uh, there was one last way that maybe uh, 
Carlson could have gone wrong. He could have played bishop to c6, and this would have allowed rook b1, and now this pawn is inevitably going to be queening with some idea like uh, rook b8 and knight b7. But like I said before, Nepomniche just, uh, uh, Carlson just shut that down and shut down any hope that Nepomniche had of ever queening that pawn after the move rook to a8. And once that pawn is stopped, uh, there's no way that white can continue to make progress. So white resigned, and now uh, Nepomniche is down uh, three games. And I'll say the same thing that I said after he lost his second game, which is Nepomniche really needs to get back his objectivity, because I think that's what he's lost. He's lost his objectivity, and he has uh, he had a great position in this game. He had a huge opportunity to just press and to play for a win against Magnus Carlsen. Um, but you you have to be objective about the position. He had very good, very strong objective winning chances in this position. He just needed to play very carefully and very slowly and just press. He's not playing against uh, a club player. He's playing against the best player in the world. So he needs to um, be very objective, very careful. He can't stop working at the board. And I just think after that long loss that he had in game six, I think that he lost his objectivity and he's just trying way too hard to play for a win. Way too hard. Um, and he just needs to get back to being objective again. So anyways, uh, Magnus goes to plus three after nine games, and it's not looking good for the challenger. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed uh, watching this video, and I hope you learned something new about chess. Thank you very much for watching.